we'll move to the last lecture for today, um, which will be given by uh, Dr. Adiolu Oyeko. Um, the title of his lecture is Transhumanism, Technopolitics and the Future of Africa. Dr. Oyeko holds a PhD from the Department of Philosophy, University of Lagos, Nigeria. He has over 15 years of teaching and research experience. He started his academic career at the Department of Philosophy, Lagos State University in 2008, and was a 2019 to 2021 postdoctoral research fellow on identities and social cohesion in Africa at the Nelson Mandela University, South Africa. His research interests include African philosophy, philosophy of culture, post-colonial studies, practical ethics, restorative justice, identity politics, and social cohesion. Dr. Yeko, please, you can have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Shimakunam. I really want to appreciate you, the center and CSP for the opportunity to uh, make a presentation um, at this colloquium. I'm also grateful to previous presenters for the various insights they, they have provided. Um, my, my contribution here is an ongoing work and um, it is, a work in progress that is open to um, contributions and then, you know, reactions from the audience in order for me to be able to make better sense of um, what I think is an important um, issue we should be focusing on in respect of um, the possible impact of transhumanism for politics in Africa. And in the age of rapid technological advancement, the idea of transhumanism has emerged as a, as a paradigm that challenges traditional notions of human existence and societal organization, rooted in the belief that humanity can and should evolve beyond its current biological limitations through the application of science and technology. Transhumanism has captured the imagination of thinkers, policy makers, and technologists worldwide. At its core, it seeks to augment human capabilities, whether biological or cognitive, with the ultimate aim of transcending what is considered as human limitations. The intersection of transhumanism and politics in Africa raises fundamental questions about the values that should or that could underpin a transhumanist society on the continent. As African nations grapple with issues of governance, development, and identity, the adoption of transhumanist principles may at first glance offer new pathways for addressing age-old challenges. However, such potential adoption also present ethical and philosophical, as well as practical dilemmas that ought to be kept carefully navigated to ensure equi um, equitable and just outcomes for all segments of the society. I'm sorry, I'm trying to trying to share my screen. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. So against this backdrop, um Okay. My... Sorry, Doc. Please, can you make it bold so that we can see it clearly from here? Um, is it better now? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, okay. That will, in a way, affect my... Okay. So, you can just uh, uh, put it on slideshow, like go to the bottom of the screen. There's a symbol towards the right at the bottom. Yeah, slideshow there. Okay. 
three bottles three. there at the bottom. After comment. Um, yeah, you're almost there. You're, you just left there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That. Oh no. No, no, no. That one. No. Yeah, that one. Okay. That one. Yeah, that one. Yes. Oh, okay. So. Oh, so, like I said, the intersection of transhumanism and politics in Africa raises fundamental questions about the values that should underpin a transhumanist society on the continent. Especially as Africa and nations grapple with the issues of governance, development, identity, the adoption of transhumanist principles, which at first glance may offer new pathways for addressing age old challenges. However, such adoptions also present some philosophical and practical dilemmas that we ought to carefully navigate and consider to ensure just outcomes for all segments. Um, so against um, this backdrop, I'm concerned about issues of how technological augmentation could reshape social identities and the prospect of transformative politics on a continent characterized by diverse socioeconomic and political challenges. Um, I aim to explore how the transfer and adoption of transhumanist ideas and innovations could potentially reshape political structures and economic dynamics in Africa, particularly amidst the increasing technologization of politics. So some of the questions that may also agitate one's mind um, relate to what may be the most suitable um, set of political values for a transhumanist Africa, the outcomes, of, uh, the outcomes and implications of transhumanism for social identities um, and political relations, as well as the challenges and opportunities inherent in embracing transhumanism on the continent. Um, I shall try to argue that while the quest for answers to the outcome questions hold um, limited significance, we ought to shift focus to the opportunity question, by which I mean a need for us to examine the potential political challenges as well as opportunities that embracing transhumanism in Africa might entail. I aim to show that the importance of access to uh, uh, the importance of the issue of access to technological augmentation, particularly in the realm of biological and cognitive enhancements, are critical opportunity issues. I will also try to contextualize the um, potential predicament of Africa within the broader goal and uh, the broader issue of the interconnectedness of transhumanist aspirations while also lay, try, trying to lay the inequalities between the global south and the global north. Such juxtaposition, I hope, will help underscore the implications for global justice and also show the imperative for nuanced considerations in navigating the complexities of transhumanism in an unequal world. Now, so when we talk about technology and politics, um, philosophers, mainly are concerned with attempts to understand both the practice of designing and creating an artifact and creating artifacts in very broad sense, including artificial processes and systems, the nature of the things that we create and the purpose for which we create them. So um, more recent focus on the relationship between philosophy and technology has continued to seek continuity with the philosophy of science and several other fields in, a, in the analytic tradition in modern philosophy, such as the philosophy of action and decision making, rather than with the humanities and social science. Now, from the time of Karl Marx, um, an idea that has been prevalent is that the material structure of production in the society technology inclusive, determines the economic and social structure of that society, the cultural and political ramifications of technology, 
have since then continued to generate philosophical interest. So while the Marxian view of technology has been described by, by some as rigidly deterministic, we also have some determinists who argue that technology to a very large extent influences the social, political, and economic configuration of a society. On the other hand, constructivists argue that technology is just one out of many social structures that evolve in arbitrary, undetermined patterns. Some, will, some have even argued further that a dystopian picture of technology, such as Heidegger's, ignores the determinist, the value neutrality of technology on the one hand and its potential for social transformation on the other. Critical of technology on their part argue that the instrumentality of technology is a form of meta choice, one which at a higher level determines which values are to be embodied in the technical framework of our lives and which opens up different possibilities of thinking about such choices. Building on this critical choice approach, there is a view that also says that we can acknowledge the significant ways in which technology has shaped the world for good and ill without necessarily succumbing to the helplessness that come with its progress, values, and ends. Such position argues that it is more correct and useful to see man and technology in a symbiotic relationship of influence, such that we are as we consciously deploy technology to address human needs in a progressive manner as homo faba. We also acknowledge the profound, sometimes unexpected changes and alterations that, set, that technology brings about. This then suggests the possibility of appropriating the benefits of technology subject to its moderation in ways that reinforce the resilience of our political and cultural um, structures. Now, so when we now talk about transhumanism and its possible impact on politics in Africa, well, we may want to ask ourselves, so what is the state or what is the nature of politics in Africa in general? At the risk of generalizing, I would say that the history of politics in Africa, especially in modern times, has largely been a negative one, such that in spite of repeated efforts at political and social economic development, the, the structures of colonialism and neocolonialism remain deep, deeply entrenched and continue to shape the continent's governance systems. Colonial boundaries that ignored ethnic, linguistic, and cultural divisions, leading to the unresolved identity conflict, con to, leading to unresolved identity conflict, continue to contribute to ethnic tensions, political instability, and sometimes civil wars, thereby undermining efforts to build inclusive and cohesive political institutions. Furthermore, the extraction-based economic systems established during the colonial system have perpetuated dependency and hindered the development of indigenous industries for sustainable growth and development. This reliance on resource extraction combined with weak governance and corruption also continues to fuel political instability as competition for control over valuable natural resources intensifies. So integration into the global economic system under an intense process of political economic and cultural globalization has not necessarily translated to shared global prosperity. Rather, the continent remains the reference point for multidimensional poverty, illiteracy, and low life expectancy. So if you add to the above, the fact that despite a wave of democratization in the 1990s and early 2000s, characterized by the adoption of multi-party systems and the building of elections, Many African countries continue to grapple with autocratic regimes, electoral fraud, and human rights abuses, as well as the prevalence of weak, uh, weak institutions, corruption, and lack of respect for rule of law. See that the political situation in Africa is indeed a dire one. This now takes us to the debate on transhumanism in Africa. Uh, so for the purpose of this talk, I have classified the current position that we have into three. On one hand, are the Afro-liberal transhumanists, um, made up mainly of two scholars that I will reference here, which is um, uh, Fayemi Ademola and, and El Osho. In the view of Fayemi, there are ontological and normative grounds for a possible defense of transhumanism in the African philosophical space. It says that a viable way of seeking harmony between transhumanist vision and the 
and the religio ontologically constituted idea of person is an embrace of Afrofuturism. Through such an embrace, he believes that the prospect of transhumanism in contemporary Africa is bright. Afrofuturism, according to him, is about critical African imaginations of a posthuman future, taking cognizance of African history, culture, and religion, and religion and philosophy. In the light of shifting dynamics in scientific, technological, and power relations in the evolving world order. Um, Finally, advance this argument using the Yoruba conception of personhood. But in another work, a few years later after this work, he co authored a paper with Ewosho, where they also extended the same argument to Ubuntu in a way to suggest that um, uh, the Afro communitarian and tendency in Africa is continent wide and that transhumanism is compatible with all. For Fire for Ewosho and Fire Me, Ubuntu humanism aims to help all humans lead happier and more fulfilling lives or higher levels of flourishing. And the normative implication of the humanist vision is that actions are judged right or wrong to the extent that they that they enhance the good and well-being of not only the agent but those of others. Ubuntu humanist morality, therefore, is inherently communal and social, according to them. The fundamental dilemma confronting transhumanism, according to them, is that its proponents want a radical change and a transition to the posthuman, but without jeopardizing core humanist values and goals. They want a posthuman future without violating human dignity and moral status. Insights from Ubuntu humanism according to them, provide profound compatibility with this lofty goal of a post-human future. Um, so from, uh, Cecil in 2023 also argued that the concept of Boto, which opposes humanism, simultaneously acknowledges individual free will as a fundamental part of personhood. So according to this Boto perspective, the humanists in uh, uh, the transhumanist framework is also compatible with um, with with African culture. Um, uh, in opposition to this um, to these liberals, is we have the conservative position of um, Amarashi Makonam. Amarashi Makonam's uh, basic argument is that number one, the idea of personhood um, proposed by Fayemi and which Fayemi feels is compatible with um, transhumanism robs humans of the power of choice. And beyond that, it also leads to uh, the creation of what she calls technologized human um, personhood, which she believes does not fit into the African communal moral, moral narrative. Um, um, there is a bit of ambivalence because in a quartered work with Aribeato in 2023, Shima Kunam then seemed to defend the idea that the communal normative function theory provides a most possible grounding for meaningful transhumanist existence. I will be glad to hear her reaction to this, but for the purpose of this presentation, I have classified her as a conservative uh, or a pessimist when it comes to transhumanism in Africa. Um, um, in the work of Thaddeus Med in, a, in an article published in 2018, Thaddeus Med worried about the possibility of enhancement limiting people's ability to share a way of life that is communal. Uh, towards the end of that paper, he mentioned that um, debate on enhancement in Africa remains under theorized. And so he was a bit ambivalent uh, in taking in taking a position. So these are the three main categories of views that we have on transhumanism in Africa from my research so far. Now, so what are the limits of this debate? So in Fayemi's um, optimistic world, transhumanism will be compatible with the African worldview. It will help, help us address the issue of corruption, I address identity crisis, uh, the, uh, the identity crisis, as well as um, help us cure people. For instance, yesterday he was talking about giving people oxytocin to help them, you know, become more sociable. 
and all of that. And I feel that his work did not take care of the choice question as posed by Shima Konam. And I believe that morality will become something else if, it's, if it is determined prior to one, you know, acquiring the capacity, you know, to, to rationally understand the society in which he lives before he begins to integrate into it. So to that extent, I agree with Shima Konam's criticism. However, um, I feel that Shima Konam's emphasis on the idea of the technology, uh, technologized personhood um, was not justified, was not advanced enough to show us why we should not have technologized personhood. Uh, it will seem as if that she um, takes for granted the idea of cultural or moral essentialism, and um, which, which presupposes that, assuming that we are even right, that African societies in contemporary times are still communal in nature, we ought to remain that way. I do not feel that there is a reason why we why that should be. Um, so, uh, culture, moral values, moral norms continue to evolve. And so I believe that um, the, the, the decision not to extend that argument for that leaves her open to criticism that she subscribes to a form of um, essentialism. Now, I am of the view that the debate on what transhumanism would mean for Africa in the descriptive sense is of notable yet limited usefulness. And my position rests on a couple of assumptions I think need to be made clear. The first is the near inevitability or very strong possibility of a transhuman and even posthuman future. This assumption is born out of one's cognizance of the rapid advancement being made in the scientific and technological sphere in different parts of the world, the global not especially. The second assumption is that we are a transhumanism may achieve some of its lofty objectives in the global north. The impact on the global south, Africa particularly, may be less than salutary. Again, this pessimistic assumption arises from the sudden acknowledgement that historically, technologies that advance the West and other parts of the world, economically and materially, do not usually achieve the same results in Africa. The possible success of transhumanist technologies elsewhere does not automatically imply same from Africa looking back to history. Again, I think it's important to quickly say that technologies do not emerge in abstract, and neither are they created from blank a historical normative standpoint. In many cases, new technologies are products of material cultures that reflect biases that perpetuate existing inequalities by privileging certain cultural perspectives while marginalizing others. It is for this reason that an interrogation of the implications of ethical and social dimensions of transhuman technologies in Africa become very imperative. Flowing from the above, it is important to also make the point that whereas technological artifacts can appear value neutral, at least on the surface, they are artifacts of moral, economic, and political engineering, inseparable from the culture, norms, policies, and ideological values that undergird their production. The design and production of technological artifacts and goods oftentimes reflect the values and biases of their creators in ways that simultaneously reflect and shape existing cultural narratives and power dynamics embedded within technological systems. I suggest then that one useful framework of analysis is racial capitalism, which refers to the mutually constitutive entanglement of racialized and colonized and colonial exploitation within the process of capital accumulation. According to this framework, capitalism as we know it today would not have been possible if not for imperialism, colonialism, racial slavery, expropriation, and super exploitation. Capital accumulation remains an unfortunate reality of African states and other developing societies, which is made possible today because of the connection between racism and capitalism. So, um, so I, I take the argument of Ruth Gilmore who proposes that it is important for us to understand uh, that to have an understanding of racial capitalism as an ideology, as the technology of anti-relationality, responsible for the reduction of collective life to those relations that sustain neoliberal democratic capitalism. For her, racism entails the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerabilities to premature death in distinct yet densely interconnected political geographies. This definition of the intersection of race and capital crucially analyzes a dialectic process in which forms of humanity 
are separated in ways that simultaneously leverage interconnectedness for intense capital expropriation and accumulation in the global north. Grimoire also describes this process as partitioning and characterizes it as the base algorithm for capitalism, which only exists and develops according to its capacity to control who can relate and under what terms. So, it is for this reason that I argue that our concern with transhumanism in Africa needs to focus more on the issue of control and access. Why the debate over the possible over possible outcomes are useful. Africa is likely to remain on the margins of the discussions of the values and assumptions that underpin transhumanist technologies unless the debate is elevated to the level of practice. Contrary to the optimism of Fayemi and Ewo Osho, it is very much conceivable that transhumanist technologies emerging from neoliberal societies will prioritize and reify autonomous and individual capacities that undermine the notions of solidarity, communalism, and harmony. Given the level of state and institutional weakness in Africa, one could also imagine a situation in which dominant groups with access to huge resources, in the absence of strong incentives that ensure fair distribution, begin to appropriate enhancement technologies for the purpose of further dominating and exploiting minority groups. So, if Africa is to partake in the possible benefits of transhumanism, it is important that it takes a decolonial approach in the transhumanism debate. There are competing material and historical tailor behind the different approaches to transhumanism. The ethical and practical outcomes of such various engagements will likely depend in large part on the force of the undergirding argument and norms, as well as the viability of the projects arising from them. African states, therefore, need to begin to convene debate about transhumanism and the imperative of being ready for it. Beyond that, however, it is important to realize that these debates are not sufficient in themselves. They will require being backed up by massive investments in transhumanist technologies that address some of the challenges facing the continent, such as, such as uh, diseases, illiteracy, and the need for climate resilience. The point I'm trying to make here is that at every point in time, it has appeared as if Africa comes late to discussions, Africa waits for technological changes to occur, and then begins to figure out how it wants to transfer these technologies as consumers, not as producers of technologies. And because we are consumers of technologies and not producers, it has been difficult for African states to direct the end goal of technological innovations. And if this should happen in the realm of transhumanism, it portends very significant implications for African societies in modern times. It could range from recolonialism to subtle, domi uh, subtle domination, as well as internal issues bordering on identity crisis, conflict, and even democratic participation. Um, to that extent, I believe that the approach to transhumanism in Africa today should not be just for us to continue to debate about what the moral implications could be, important as those, uh, as those discussions are. We should begin to take the discussion to policymakers to also make them understand that we, Africa cannot sit passively and wait for um, capitalists that sit in Western, in, in, in Western capitals to define to sponsor, even to, to even fund researches that will provide the guidance for how we ought to proceed. When we allow such to happen, these countries that are at the forefront of uh, technological advancement in the realm of um, transhumanism will be the ones to determine, for instance, the type of moral values that will be in Fayemi's proposal as coaching. And that could spell do not only for Africa as we know it, but for other, uh, other countries in the global north. So in ending, I want to say that what we are doing here is very, very important, but it requires that we take this up and begin to make governments in Africa see the need to begin to invest properly in the type of technology as well as research programs that will enable Africa to rise up and play a very significant role in the development of transhumanist technologies 
such that if and when there is a need to have a global convergence in terms of regulation, in terms of control, in terms of input, in terms of the character of transhumanist technologies, Africa will also have a seat at the table. At the present, we are witnesses to discussions between the US and China over how to regulate AI and, and such. Nobody is calling Africa to such discussions because we are not contributing, Africa is not contributing anything at the moment to development in that realm, at least in a significant sense. And it means that at the end of the day, the, the, the technological powers will harmonize their own interest, achieve uh, what I can call a form of singularity at the normative level, which they will now impose on the rest of the world. And this in various ways has been the pattern historically. Africa simply waits to consume when it has been produced. But at the trans transhumanist level, waiting to consume technology would eventually consume Africa itself. I want to thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Weko, for your presentation. Um, it is really thought provoking, a lot of ideas running in my head. Once again, thank you. Um, please, can you stop sharing? Okay, the floor is open for questions, for contributions, um, for comments. If you have any, even for the previous speakers, you can raise your hand up while I call you. Okay, Emmanuel, please, you can ask your question or make your contribution. Thank you. Emmanuel, are you still here with us? Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, Emmanuel. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank the speaker for such a wonderful presentation. However, the idea that transhumanism is compatible with African culture that the speaker made mention of, I don't think that is possible. And his argument are not so convincing. And also this issue of African identity, which has been a, at the core of debate of, in African philosophy. I don't see how it is possible for transhumanism to resolve the problem of identity in Africa. Rather, I would have even prefer if the presenter argued that transhumanism as it were, we compound the problem of identity in Africa. Please, I just want him to throw more light on this issue of transhumanism being compatible with African culture and how also it could serve as a panacea to the problem of identity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, let's take another um, question or comments from Dudzuru before we call the speaker to respond. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Amara, for the opportunity. My question then relates to the speaker's classification of African politics as negative. He said African politics has been negative. What does he mean by that? Is he referring to wars and political crisis in Africa? And do we just classify it as negative without unearthing the issues that lead to wars and crisis in Africa? And how about the lens that maybe the negativity is a search for a positive transformation, which is African and rooted on African philosophy. Just as we talk about transhumanism, can we also relate it to the kind of transformation that can happen in Africa based on the situation that people are also transforming? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Eko, please, you can respond. Thank you. OK, so I will apologize to the two questioners. It would appear as if I was a little bit fast in covering some of the things I said. Uh, so it looks as if some of the things I said didn't come across exactly in the way I wanted them to be understood. 
I didn't say that transhumanism is necessarily compatible with African culture. I merely restated what some African scholars have said. Um, I, I said that Fayemi and Ewosho are the optimists when it comes to transhumanism in Africa. And then I advanced the argument uh, that they have provided. Um, so for me, um, we should not be dwelling too much in the realm of speculation, although we need to anticipate what could happen. But there is also a boundary to it. And so when it comes to the issue of African identities in a transhumanist world, you, you, you see, the, the, the optimist will tell you that by the time we arrive at that post-human epoch, the issue of somebody being white, somebody being Zulu, somebody being Kosan, uh, somebody being Hausa or Igbo, would have disappeared. All of us would have become enhanced human beings, uh, and our primordial identities may no longer matter. The religion you practice uh, will, will, ma will matter less if it does matter at all. That is the argument they have put forward. But I have also said in this presentation that it could go the other way around. Suppose a very powerful ethnic group seizes power in a particular country and decides to enhance members of its own group to the detriment of others. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot rule that possibility out if we have seen instances in which uh, ethnic domination and appropriation of resources has been one of the realities of African politics. So uh, we can look at the possibilities in negative and positive senses, but I have also concluded by saying that it is better for us to consider the possibility of negative outcomes for Africa and then begin to prepare towards it. I consider that to be a prudential approach, um, you know, uh, for us to be able to deal with the, the outcomes of transhumanism because it will seem as if there is nothing we say in Africa in terms of the moral implications that will stop the actual, you know, uh, the, the imminent arrival of transhumanist technologies. And so we will be prepared or we will simply continue to moralize the way we continue to moralize about technologies that have damaged our environment while enriching the global north. Yeah, so we see oil spillages in Africa, whereas the companies that have taken the oil have used the resources, you know, to develop their own society. So, but we continue to complain because we were not part of the conversations when those technologies were being built. And so that is my position. Uh, for, for the zero, um, yes, I talked about the, the net negative, uh, you know, result of politics in Africa because when you look at it, it will look as if the continent is dotted, you know, with crises here and there. Um, just pick, take a random look at African countries, South Africa, Nigeria, Sudan, Mali, and, you know, and you, it, it, it becomes very difficult for you to find a very bright space. Yes, I'm not saying that every single African country, you know, is experiencing negativity in terms of economic, social, and social development. But I'm saying on the overall, the continent could be in, the, in a much better shape. And yes, I tried to harp on the, uh, you know, on the causes of this particular situation in which Africa has found itself within the limit of time that I had. I talked about colonialism, and I also talked about internal issues or, you know, of weak institutions, you know, the yeah, corruption, leadership crisis and all that. Of course, these factors reinforce one another. I mean, and by that, I mean the external, you know, the external issues as well as the internal ones, they, 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 they are mutually reinforcing. Uh, so in the midst of that quandary, you know, technology continues to advance in societies that appear to be a little bit stable. And so Africa is caught in an existential crisis, trying to solve the issue of poverty, the issue of hunger, while some, who are relatively well fed are beginning to think about how we should move to the next stage of our evolution. This time around, a human induced evolution as opposed to nature, you know, taking, taking its course. I do hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Oyeko. We we'll still have more time for engagement. Please, if you have a question or comments or contribution to make, you can raise your hand up 
Okay, before I call you, um, Emmanuel. Oh, let me go with um, Lucky first, then Emmanuel. So please, Lucky, um, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question or make your contribution. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon here. I'm speaking from University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria. Uh, the speaker came in a bit late. Uh, it was already on before I actually came in. You see, when we speak, talk of Africa, are we talking of Africa in terms of something similar to a group of French citizens belonging to same cultural and uh, linguistic categories? We know even, let us speak of Nigeria here, University of Port is in Nigeria. Within Nigeria here, this, well, the, uh, the speaker will agree the degree of inherent diversities in terms of different factors for categorization. Transhumanism, this idea, historical, I mean uh, ontological. Can we as far as speak of Africa or we better, it's better for us to honestly identify the different categories and then probably evolve areas of similarities. Example, in 1993, the defunct Slovakia, made up of the Sec and the Slovakians, they separated. Today, you have the Sec, uh, Sec and the Slovakia country, as called kind of different countries. Even in Belgium, you see the problem there. The Flanders, Wallonia, the problem consists, continue. Why should Africa be pretending, attempting to grieve the pressure of being monolithic when actually the basis does not exist? Look at the different countries. The case of Rwanda is very clear to us here. Yeah? Within Nigeria, we have problems. In South Africa, about two, three years ago, uh, there was a crisis and Ramaphosa accused the Zulu. And so for, I'm asking the presenter, find paper, find effort. Can we actually speak of Africa or Africans as being monolithic and the idea of transhumanism can provide such basis for being assumed as monolithic. I please, I will say come back again. Let me just stop here first. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, ma'am. Emmanuel, please unmute yourself and ask your question or make your contribution. Please make it very brief so that we can have room for others. Thank you. Thank you, please. I just want to ask again, is transhumanism not part of the evolution theory, or is it different? Okay. Um. Before we take your question, Professor Jans, um, Doctor Yeko, please you can respond. Ah. Well, for the last question, I will probably refer Emmanuel to the presentation by, um, by Ado. I think he tried to. He tried to he tried to address that issue, uh, I, but if if I may attempt an answer, I think it it it, it it's based on perspectives. Um, you know, so some will say it, it it it's a bio, it's a biological process. We are wired biologically to seek to transcend our limitations after a certain epoch. Um, so if you believe in that, you will say that yes, it's an evolutionary process, but this is. Like I said, this is not. This appears to me not to be nature doing natural selection. This is this is engineered transition, in a way. Um, that does not necessarily, you know, you know, disregard the valid points by those who think it is part of our nature to evolve. Um, but I will think that um, uh, Darwinian evolution, as explained, you know, is not at is not necessarily you know, on all fours, 
through the type of evolution that transhumanism envisages. We are the ones actually, you, you know, for the first time, we are talking about a kind of telos here. Okay, so this thing that we are designing, what should it look like? And when I talk about telos, I'm not talking about telos in a metaphysical sense. Uh, we, we, these are telos into which we are imputing our uh, norms, uh, potential and actual ones. Um, so it, it's an open, it's an open debate. Yeah. So the first question: Can we talk about Africa? Yes, we can talk about Africa. We do not need to agree with the state of Africa as it is before we can agree, you know, with the reality that Africa exists. Um, Africa, <laughs> at the Berlin Conference, the people who partitioned Africa saw it as a concrete, objective material reality. And they partitioned it arbitrarily. Uh, it didn't matter whether we Africans were at the table to say no, we are we don't belong to the same culture, we don't speak the same language, don't lump us together. They lumped us together for the purpose of their own, you know, objectives. And so, in that sense, I believe we can talk about Africa. That does also not diminish the significance of agitations across different African states by groups who feel that they will do better if uh, they are allowed to exercise their right to self-determination. I believe that um, such groups um, should enjoy uh, you know, the right to collective autonomy and decide whether they would like to remain as part of those you know, colonial legacies that we refer to as post-colonial African states, or whether they want to go on their own you know, and pursue their collective destinies in different directions. Um, this again does not necessarily mean that you know seceding from a from a post-colonial state will solve all the problems. Um, as we have seen in, in, in one or two instances, it is also possible for a state to be multicultural and yet be progressive. What should matter to us is whether people are coming together to make a state, a viable state, out of multiple nations, are doing it on terms that they found that they find agreeable and to which they have voluntarily subjected themselves. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Yeko, for your um response. Professor Jans, please um, mute yourself, ask your question, or make your contribution. Thank you. Yeah, I actually wanted to respond to the earlier point that was being made about uh, um, a, a couple of comments ago by Lucky about the um, uh, the idea that the uh, formation of nationhood doesn't uh, make any logical sense in some cases. And I th think that's absolutely right, but that's true around the world, certainly. I mean, my own country of Canada um, you know, is an amalgamation of the British, the French, and the indigenous peoples. And it, on paper, it should not make any sense either. And I think part of part of it is, I mean, this is why I developed my, you know, notion of place. Um, you know, we are always in a certain sense building place uh, and we are participating in multiple places at the same time. And so, you know, yes, uh, some African countries make no sense at all and some may not last in the form that they currently have for a variety of reasons. But, um, but the question is, you know, are there ways that people can see a, a path forward together? Um, that's a difficult question, and there's no one answer to that question. But I don't think um, it necessarily is going to be determined by whether the uh, formation of the state uh, made sense to begin with, because I think we can give lots of examples of, of just where it doesn't. I mean, India makes no sense as a country. Right. I mean, it's vastly diverse. It's put together by the British in some ways and, and other kinds of thing. I mean, you know, we could talk about what that looks like on paper and then, you know, what it is right now. And so that's my uh, contribution to that. I think I think the question always is, can we see a way forward? And that relates to um, you know questions around transhumanism, I think, because it's the same kind of question. Right. I mean, if the transhuman question is, how can we ask a new question. How can we see a way forward? How can we create who we are rather than simply rely on who we have been? Then that's really the same question. Technology is sometimes that issue. Other kinds of things are sometimes that issue as well. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, I think you're. I think you're Hello? muted. Can I? Sorry for jumping in. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. You can go on, Imano. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ma, for allowing me. Um, Professor, um, Professor Yekon and, and myself met at uh, Ife last year, where at a conference where he, you know, um, addressed the same issue of how can we make something out of, you know, the political mess that many African, many post-independent African states um, um, are. So my my observation from, you know, the discussion so far is there are actually African thinkers, African um, um, humanists, if we may call them that, who whose contribution I believe we are not really taking um, full advantage of. People like um, Franz Fanon um, warned even before um, people started talking about post-colonialism, for example, about you know that oppression doesn't really end with um, um, colonialism. That you know so certain vestiges of colonialism will continue after the end of colonialism, and that um, we need to actually set our foot um, a new history for humanity. So he, he was talking about the need to recreate the history of humanity and overcome differences and things like that. Other figures are people like um, Tai, tai Shulain, for example, who warned about the excesses of, of religiosity, which as a Nigerian, I know is a big problem, you know, superstition and, and, and things like that. Somebody like Wale Shoinga, for example, is still very much with us, but he has written so much about, you know, the project of, you know, moral restitution of, post-independent African countries and things like that. So I think there are indeed African humanist thinkers, I wouldn't say transhumanist, but thinkers who have made a lot of contributions to humanism that I think we should you know, be talking more about that we are not uh, you know, doing enough about. The, the problem isn't necessarily um, the case, a case of, um, okay, how do we make Nigerianness? I think it's just a case of understanding how, you know, emphasizing the fact that we all are humans and we need to emphasize um, what makes us human. And maybe from there, we will be able to define what it is to be Nigerian and things like that. Um, also, I noticed from um, Professor, um, I think, Cesiro's presentation, I was hoping she would mention something about um, Peter Singer's definition of um, personhood and you know how he just opposed it with how you know he problematize the issue of speciesism and things like that. But, and also um, somebody like Michael Sandel, what he um, wrote, wrote about the um, problems that can arise from you know, um, enhancements. So, but these are just my observations about the things that we seem to have left out. And I think will really enrich conversations like this, even though they may not you know, be obvious. Um, thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel, for your contribution. Okay, before I call you, um, Professor Ko, Ko Lawale, um, I would like to read out um, two questions here on the chat box um, directed to, one is for Doreen, then um, the other is for Abdul. So the first one that is for Abdul asks, what is the relationship between transhumanism and the enlightenment period? Then the question here for um, Doreen asks, metaphysical personhood is a very difficult idea. Can transhumanism help us to move beyond the difficulties of describing what we mean when we talk about persons? Okay, uh, before you people will respond, uh, Professor Ko Kolawale, please um, make your contribution or ask your question and please be very brief, thank you. Thank you. Um, an interesting aspect of the conversation going on was when someone asked the question whether uh, with transhumanism, uh, uh, Africa will become one, there will be no Zulu, there will be no Hausa, and so on and so forth. This is the real problem we have. The purpose of colonialism 
the purpose of sharing out Africa at Berlin Conference is to erase the identity of the African as having no history. We have been several millennia before they came. They tried to erase all the activity of our ancestors and created, for instance, Nigeria in place of the Thief land, Yoruba land, House land. And since then, they've invested much into making sure that we bear the, the identity Nigerian and not Thief, not Yoruba, not Igbo. This is where the real issue is. It is a form of annihilation, extermination, and we begin, uh, you, uh, Nigeria are uh, created by the English, and they have no firm ground in the past of the African history. So what we have now is an attempt to meld, to meld together from all, all uh, indigenous nationalities in this part of West Africa, which they now call Nigeria, into a kind of superhuman, super national Nigerian. But it's not possible to meld. The, those who have tried to do that in Nigeria were uh, Mohammed, uh, Murtala Mohammed and Obasanjo. They've invested a lot into this and they are still doing it. And but the more they try to meld, the more the diversity have to raise its head that no, I'm not Nigeria, I'm Thief. I'm not Nigeria, I'm Higi. I'm not Nigeria, I'm Bashama. That's the issue. We need to trace this issue very uh, 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 historically and scientifically in order to retrace back and rediscover the real identity of the African. And we should put an end to this melding dimension. And they invest a lot into it by making sure that we maintain the structure they put down as representing a nation fake nation created by them. Now we have them 54 on the continent. Before Africa would begin to, be, uh, to begin to develop as real human beings, we be when we uh, reintegrate people of same stock, like the Kanuri split into four. They are in Nigeria, they are in Chad, they are in uh, Cameroon, when they are brought together to form the Kanuri nation state, they will speak Kanuri language, use their culture to revive, to regain their strength. The mutilation will end there, and uh, uh, emasculation will cease there, and they become real, genuine human beings. When the Yoruba split into four, for instance, in Nigeria, in, in Togo, in Ghana, and Benin Republic, when they become one and they forge their now development based on their past historical uh, antecedent, you see that development will be very fast. And in fact, they will be shortening decade into years. Okay, Things we do for decade um, will be done by two years. Okay, Prof, sorry to cut in. Please, can so you the summarize idea, your we, comments, please? Yes, what I'm saying is that the, we now what we have in Africa is not real identity. The Nigerian man is not properly the Igbo or the Yoruba, not properly English. They speak English. They try to, it's part of the program of the colonial uh, interlopers 
to assimilate. They are trying to assimilate us to English culture with English language they call English of uh, language of unity. So it's a way of imposing that language and we forget our own. So we need to retrace our, our footstep and follow the, the resolution of the All African Conference of 1958, okay, which took Prof. place in Accra. Um, thank you so much, Prof. The party you for your that, no, that's the last word. Okay. That's the last word. That after independence, we should retrace our, our, our history and regain the, the natural contour of the continent and not Nigeria, Kenya, and so on and so forth. Re re regain our real identity and our real history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof, for your comments. Um, before we'll call you Professor Lucky, um, Abdul, please unmute yourself and give your response to one of the questions directed to you. Thank you. All right, so the question directed to me was um, asking if there's any relationship between transhumanism and the enlightenment. Yes, there is. Um, the works of Max Moore and James Hughes, they categorically say transhumanism is an intellectual descendant of the enlightenment. Um, and this, they place transhumanism as an intellectual cousin of humanism, that both of them descended from the enlightenment because it was during the enlightenment that such views as um, belief in progress, uh, uh, championing of reason, um, freedom, okay, liberalism, and trying to um, free man from supernatural authority and make man feel like um, he has control over his destiny. All such optimistic, humanistic, liberal, progressive thoughts came from the Enlightenment. And transhumanism today can be seen as an outgrowth of, of um, such views. Um, so even called transhumanism Enlightenment 2.0. Okay, so it is, um, of course, it is descended from the Enlightenment and it is linked to it. There's another question before now, which says, which active transhumanism is linked to the fourth industrial revolution. Yes, they are linked because they both emphasize almost the same kind of emerging and converging technologies be them nanotechnology, biotechnology, info, or cognitive technologies. The same technologies that would drive the fourth industrial revolution are the same technologies that transhumanists talk about. So in, 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 in essence, if you are chasing the transhumanist civilization, you are um, at the same point also looking towards the fourth industrial revolution. So that's... Thank you, um, Mr. Abdul. Um, please, Dr. Doreen, are you still here with us? If you are kindly unmute yourself and respond to one of the questions directed to you before we take our last um, question or contribution for today. Uh, how can metaphysics uh, assist us? You see, metaphysics uh, deals with uh, the nature of reality, what uh, things essentially are. So I think metaphysics is, 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 a, metaphysics is important because um, we, we are looking at what persons and human beings are. Uh, before we, 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 we say um, whether, how they should be treated, we be, before we say how they should be treated, we must establish um, what they are, their whatness, their essence. And I think it's, it's, it's fundamental uh, to, to make metaphysical claims, you know, which can uh, then be used to make uh, moral implications. So that's how, that's what makes, uh, uh, metaphysics important. I've realized that most of most of the scholars uh, who make uh, who discuss um, transhumanism uh, in the African perspective, they 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 only look at the ethical considerations. So 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 um, my position is to make uh, metaphysical claims, which can then be used to discuss uh, moral implications. Thank you. I think that's helpful. Yes, thank you very much, um, Dr. Doreen. Uh, please, Professor Lucky, um, unmute yourself and ask your question or make your contribution, but please let it be brief. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It will be brief. My just uh, observation 
it's along the trajectory of uh, what Professor Godawale uh, was actually I mean, uh, putting forward. I just want to inform. You see, when we talk of this transhumanism, uh, uh, African scholar evoking concepts to rationalize and justify uh, what coloniality has actually done to us. In 1830, Belgium separated from Netherlands. In 1965, Singapore separated from Malaysia. 1921, uh, Ireland separated from United Kingdom. 1905, Norway split from Denmark. So when we are talking about this transhumanism, why was why should it be in relationship to only Africa? Why could transhumanism not be able to avert the disintegration along the lines of nationalities in the defense Soviet Union? in Yugoslavia. Let's understand one concept here, or one uh, narrative here. What, when we fail in Africa, we say ethnic, ethnic. In Europe, they use the word nations. As I mean, they within us here in Nigeria, you speak along this trajectory or what our uh, Professor Guda always spoke, and I say, oh, you are very ethnic. But it is global. So I just want me, what I want to say for the scholars, why could transhumanism uh, not be able, I mean, to uh, be able to prevent the disintegration of Yugoslavia, Soviet Union, even Czechoslovakia? When we are talking of India, the Hindu, they constitute about 56%. There's a superordinate culture there. So uh, the guest speaker, please, why could transhumanism not actually avert the disintegration of this SY, these different countries. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Prof. Okay, um, in regards to, in addition to this, um, Dr. Yeko, I should we say that uh, maybe we should abandon the talk of transhumanism in Africa entirely because Africa seems to have so many important uh, problems that they need to deal with rather than looking at one futuristic idea called transhumanism. I don't know what will be your take on this. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I'm actually, I'm actually saying that we, we are condemned to respond to developments in the realm of transhumanist technology, because if we do not, it will impact us in ways that are you know far more significant than previous technologies have impacted us i was reading a i, I was reading a light-hearted quote um, on twitter yesterday and somebody was saying oh how did we end up like this how did we end up colonized and then somebody said because our forefathers were led to manufacturing ships that could sail across the sea <laughs> and that that was the single most important factor in how we got here. Of course, it was just a tweet and people were, you know, were bantering. But the significance of it for me is for every technological development that we fail to take part of, that we sit idly on our hands to simply consume, we widen the gap between ourselves and those who invent such technologies. So we should embrace transhumanism, not just by anticipating the possible benefits, but by being active players in that realm, by shaping, you know, transhumanist technologies in ways that we feel, in ways that we feel will address some of our challenges, or if if not if not all of them. Um, so if at the end of the day, transhumanism is going to be the end of humanity because of some unforeseen, you know, consequences. Then we 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 all take the fallout together. But if we simply say, oh no, transhumanism is not good for Africa, or no, don't worry, transhumanism will be good for Africa, and we do not insert ourselves into the discussion, we run the risk of um, ending up in a situation where transhumanism will come, and those who have brought about its domination of the world will now determine what they want to use it for in Africa. That's the reason why I keep talking about TELOS, our mm -hmm. man-made values 
and you know our material uh, yeah, the the material determinism that goes into the making of these technologies to to continue to partition us and divide us in spite of the fact that we that you know that that globalization has superficially turned the world into a global village with the the differences cannot be more stark you know yeah you know so that is the reason why i feel we cannot we cannot avoid the transhumanist debate in africa Thank you um very much, Dr. Oyeko. Um, Professor Jans, I don't know whether you have something to add to this question. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Shima Kunam. I actually asked the question. You can use it as your last word. I I would like you to clarify your position on transhumanism, especially in respect of the water uh, by yourself and then Dr. Aribia, because that work suggests to me that you are beginning to have a change of heart and you feel that communalism is in some ways compatible with um, transhumanism, but we can take other contributions and then when you are rounding up, you can address my question. And if time will not permit, we can continue, you know, after the colloquium. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Jans, I don't know whether you have something to say on this. Should Africa not worry itself with one futuristic project somewhere called transhumanism and focus on the immediate problems um, that is confronting it right now? Well, I don't think that these are mutually exclusive questions, right? I mean, Africa lives in the world now, and that world right now is a world in which uh, some countries are very precarious. Uh, mm -hmm. The, uh, the um, structures of colonialism live on. In many cases, I think uh, some of the previous commenters have rightly pointed out the very artificial boundaries of, of countries, um, you know, that that make them difficult propositions to actually, uh, you know, um, work in the real world. Uh, I think if you go back and look even at the formation of ethnic groups within Africa, you're going to find a lot of fluidity um, uh, well before colonialism as well. There's not a simply... Uh, uh, you know, homogenous sort of thing that existed from time immemorial. There's always been, um, uh, you know, uh, emergence, breaking up, uh, combining all sorts of things of that nature. Um, you know, uh, a language like Swahili, for example, we take as, as an African language as well we should, and yet it is highly uh, influenced by um, the Arab um, Swahili coast uh, traders. And so the language itself has a great deal of uh, Arabic in it. And so, so there's always been, in other words, a kind of project of, of reimagining, um, you know, given a set of conditions. The, the problems are extreme. I mean, I, in my talk, I talked about the problems of the environment, which are extreme, but the problems within Africa uh, in many countries are also extreme, and those cannot be uh, ignored. I guess the question is, what is the way forward? And I think one answer to that is uh, in something like transhumanism, not as not as kind of a, a band-aid solution or not a um, you know a, a magical sort of thing that's going to make everything better, but maybe a different way of positioning how we ask questions about how to go forward into the future. Um, you know, I think that's where its value is, not not in uh, you know here's the latest uh, magical wand that we can wave and and solve everything. That doesn't exist, I don't think. Um, so yeah, I mean, the real problems of Africa are uh, cannot be wished away and cannot be ignored. But I don't think that means we shouldn't think about these things. Thank you very much, Prof, for your response. Um, I'm so sorry, Professor um, Kolawale and uh, Professor Loki, if that is a new hand up. Um, we cannot take more questions and uh, contributions or comments, but the conversation should continue after this um, colloquium. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, before I round up, I would like to make an announcement. I'm co-editing a book with Dr. Idika on her historical perspective in African philosophy. Please, if you are interested in contributing, um, a chapter to this book project, you can write to me at amaraesther35 at gmail.com so that will send you an invitation to contribute a chapter. Once again, thank you to our speakers for sharing their knowledge.
with us. Thank you to all the participants for your comments, for your contributions, for your questions. And um, thank you to Conversational School of Philosophy and the Center for Phenomenology in South Africa for um, collaborating with me on this project. I'm grateful to all of you. And let the conversation not start here, not stop here, I mean to say. Um, let the conversation continue and let there be um, African voices added to the discourse of transhumanism and moral enhancements. Bye-bye. Thanks to the organizers. Uh, yeah, bye, have a nice day. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, everybody. Congratulations, Amma. You did excellently well. Congratulations. Thank you. Bye bye.